welcome or oh, welcome back to the Innovation and Engagement Conference. Um, a warm welcome to our penultimate panel, Democratic by Design, which will run until approximately 3 p.m. Um, my name's Karis, um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I have short brown hair, um, I'm wearing a green top and I I'm wearing bright red lipstick today because why not? <laughs> Don't get occasion too often at the minute. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time today, to give you a bit of background and context to this event, the Innovation and Engagement Conference has been collaborati collaboratively developed to nurture cross-sector and cross-organisational learning. We're hoping to profile and celebrate radically inclusive and social practices, uh, initiatives that are developed for and with local constituents and thinking about the sustainability and challenges of this work. Um, some of the conversations and questions we were considering when thinking about what it means to be democratic by design, um, we were thinking about what alternative anti-capitalist approaches we can adopt in organising and structuring cultural organisations that foster true equity, equity, how we can operate to generate inclusive shared community wealth, health and well-being on a local level, what the challenges in, cha in changing what the model of a civic institution might look like, who owns and governs our creative institutions, what, the what is the sector's relationship to the state, um, and how could a commons overcome or provide an alternative to the hostile environment. Um, before I hand you over to Josh, um, a little bit of housekeeping uh, to get everybody settled and set up today. Uh, just so you know, Fergus is our tech support today. Um, you can't see his camera, but he is here in the background troubleshooting and helping anybody who um, has any technical questions. So feel free to um, message uh, Fergus directly if you have any trouble with that. Um, as you may notice, we're also joined today by Jenny and Claire, our BSL interpreters, um, who will be taking it in turns every 20 minutes uh, to exchange uh, and swap over. So if you're using this uh, interpretation, if you just want to pin uh, the interpreter to your screen using the three dots on the right hand side of their video. Um, a huge thank you to their services today. Um, we're also joined by Be Becky, who is our visual scribe. Hi, Becky. Um, and she's capturing today's conversations um, as, a, as a really beautiful um, illustration uh, to capture the spirit of, of the conversations. And you can see there, that's one from earlier today as well that uh, she'll be working on throughout. So feel free to be curious and have a look at what she's up to. And we will share, um, share the illustrations after the event for you all to see. Um, so that's a really beautiful legacy. Um, today's event is being recorded and the videos will be available at a later date with captioning on our website. And we'll let you know when those go up. And we really welcome and encourage your thoughts, responses, comments, questions throughout. So please feel free to use the chat function uh, to say hi and to ask questions and to use the Q&A function to ask questions to the panel. And I'm sure Josh will address these questions towards the end of the discussion today. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce you to Josh Gabbert doyon who is hosting today's panel. Um, a brief introduction to Josh. Um, Josh is a, a writer, radio producer and digital strategist uh, with Commonwealth, a think tank that focuses on the politics of ownership. And at Commonwealth, he's currently running a research programme focused on digital cooperatives. Um, Commonwealth is an independent think tank designing ownership institutions for more democratic and sustainable econ economy. From place-based approaches to, to strategies to democratize capital at scale, from the commons to cooperatives, Commonwealth develops research and interactive digital projects, working with policymakers and civil society organizers throughout the UK, US and beyond. Past work has focused on worker ownership, the Green New Deal and democratic digital infrastructures. Josh, hello. Thank you for joining us and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Karis. Um, and thank you also to uh, Carrie, who um, is also one of the organizers. Um, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really excited for this uh, panel um, and, and this discussion that we'll be having today. 
Um, the schedule um, for us is going to be kind of a five to 10 minutes introduction from um, the three of us, the three speakers. Um, and then we're going to plunge into some kind of guided questions that I'll be uh, posing um, to Boyana and to Louis. Um, and then we will move on to kind of questions from the audience, um, likely in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I've been told that it's a pretty tight uh, turnaround between this panel and the following panel. So we're going to make sure that we, um, we finish on time. Um, what else do I have to tell you guys? Um, I guess we're, it's going to be relatively loose um, and we're going to just try to think about some of these ideas um, and, um, and see where we go, really. Um, I'm not going to start uh, with the five, 10 minute introduction, um, but I will pass it off to Boyana first. Um, I'm also going to introduce Louis, but uh, Boyana is um, an artist, uh, writer and researcher with Migrants and Culture, um, which is a really fantastic group. Um, and I guess, you know, the main objective that with that group is thinking about the hostile environment and particularly how it comes up in um, cultural organizations, arts organizations, um, and thinking a bit about, or she'll be speaking a little bit, I guess, today about um, the commons um, and kind of different forms of governance and what that uh, might be able to do, you know, governance within institutions to address some of the issues around the hostile environment and, um, and, and those related issues around uh, migrants uh, who are working in the cultural sector. Um, Louis um, is with Food Hall, the Food Hall Project, which um, is based out of Sheffield. Um, and he'll be speaking today um, about community resourcing and uh, the commons in practice and how we go from kind of these theoretical questions um, that, that we tend to deal with in the um, social and cultural sector um, and really bring them into, into practice. Um, so I'm excited to hear from, from both of them and, and to uh, pose some questions to you guys. Um, we tried to make sure that things stay um, sort of, um, I guess, uh, more anecdotal and more storytelling um, and a bit engaging because I know that these events um, can, be, uh, can be hard, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, so I'll uh, let Boyana start um, and kind of talk a little bit about um, her work and then we can go from there. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. So hi, everyone, as Josh said, I'm, uh, my name is Boyana and I'm an artist uh, and an immigrant. And I also work in part as part of Migrants in Culture. Um, we are a network of migrants organizing to create conditions of safety, agency and solidarity in the culture sector for migrants, people of color and everyone else who's impacted by the UK's immigration regime. And I'm going to try and use this 10 I thought it was 15 minutes. I'm going to cut as we go, but I'm going to... Uh, we, can, we can totally do 15 minutes. Let's, let's push it uh, to 10, 15. That's totally uh, fine. I, I apologize. Hopefully I don't go on for too long, but I'm going to use it. I wanted to introduce you to some of the ways we work in, how we work in, what kind of tell you what we do and how we do it and how we're kind of using our work to also formulate ways of, of working that speak to this topic of democratic by design while trying to nudge... Um, uh, the, the culture sector towards a more uh, unhostile environment for migrants. So our work started um, from this personally experienced frustration as we are migrants of, of simultaneous hypervisibility and complete invisibility in the culture sector. So on the one hand, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, I've seen it as audiences, um, there is a lot of frequently tokenistic um, uh, examples of representation of migrants in the cultural sector, not infrequently by, by people who are not migrants themselves. Whilst on the other hand, if you're actually a cultural worker, uh, you are most likely finding yourself in a workplace uh, that has that offers no support and um, legal or employment wise and feels very precarious. Um, and so we wanted to do something about it. And the first thing we did from this flu from this intersection of, of visibility and, and complete invisibility uh, is um, we decided to collect some evidence on the situation because as it turned out, it wasn't enough to tell people no one is, is particularly paying attention to the rights of migrants in situation of migrants. Um, because one of the problems with invisibility is that migrancy is not legally defined in the UK. It means it doesn't factor into equality legislation and therefore it means that no one is particularly thinking 
about it as, as a qualifier, um, as a reason for discrimination. So um, I'll, put a, I'll put a link in the chat. The first thing we did um, was a survey where we collected quantitative and qualitative evidence on the impact of the hostile environment on the cultural sector. Uh, here's the link. Um, and you can reach testimonies from people experiencing it um, and having to implement the hostile environment policies in the sector. And you can also look at some data. Um, but what we basically were able to find evidence for is um, an overwhelming majority of people who are afraid, who feel fear and anxiety over hostile environment and how it impacts their lives. Um, and also over half, closer to 60 percent, cultural workers saying they're experiencing things like additional bureaucracy, racism, racialization, um, discrimination, losing jobs, commissions, opportunities as a result of being a migrant. While a similar percent of people working in senior management told us we don't know much about the hostile environment. We have absolutely no resources to support migrant workers and we have no policies for that. Um, two things about the way we work happened while we were doing the, the survey that I want to point us to. One is that um, a, a kind of community of migrant culture workers started building around this work. Another thing that comes with not having a category, not being legally protected, is that that, that community building in the art sector was difficult to do and that started happening. Uh, organically while we started doing this work. And another thing is that we conducted survey coalitionally. So we worked with a number of organizations who both work in the migrant support sector, um, people like Migrants Organize or Unis Resist Border Controls, but then also people in the cultural sector organizations who are already um, recognizing the situation, or at least were willing to talk about it, um, such as Art Satman, a Live Art Development Agency, Melbourne Theatre, and so on and so forth. And then the second juncture I want to talk about sorry. is when. Oh, sorry, is Claire here, the interpreter? When you list agencies or names, could you just slow down a little bit? Yes, I'm I am sorry. Them. Yes, I am Thank sorry. You. Let's go for shorter names as well. Uh, sorry, Claire. Okay, so the second juncture I want to talk to is from here. One of the questions we asked ourselves is okay, how do we bring this community into the decision-making of this new movement that is growing, right? Uh, how does it not end up being seven people or 10 people who happen to have gotten together to organize trying to speak for a community? So the second juncture I want to talk about is an event that we organized, um, an activation day we organized in January 2020, at the end of January 2020, mm. called uh, Migrants Make Culture Together Again. Uh, against a hostile environment. Uh, and I am now going to try and play a video that should tell you, um, show you what it was rather than me telling you. So uh, let's try this. This is an activation day uh, organized by Migrants and Culture and Keep It Complex. And the purpose of today is to connect with and to strengthen a movement that is able to resist the British government's hostile environment policy, both within and outside the cultural sector. So our invitation for you today is to really focus on our collective energies, our collective intelligence, our collective resources to think about how do we create a cultural sector that enables migrants, people of colour and others being impacted by unjust and racist immigration policies to thrive. Simple. So the agenda today is in your um, beautiful handbook. Um, we're going to get to know who's in the room um, and then we're going to go into breakout workshops and we've got some really great um, uh, areas of work that we're going to look at. So workplace discrimination with United Voices of the World, a fair immigration reform charter with Migrants Organize, uh, resisting border controls uh, in higher education with Unis Resist Border Controls, and creating conditions for migrant artists to thrive and we're going to kick off the afternoon with um, exercising our imaginations by reworlding the cultural sector through fiction writing with Susan Butler. 
and then we're going to end the day building our collective demands uh, with neon movement builders. So it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good day. <laughs> the hostile environment, I think, affects us all, whether we know it or not. Um, and what it is, uh, is a general and pervasive um, atmosphere that makes this country a less hospitable place. Um, we went through two scenarios, um, and which kind of uh, really put all that in place. And those two scenarios were, we are given an art commission to work with a local migrant group. The funder insists that everybody needs the legal right to be in the UK. Um, and the other scenario was that there is a border agency van outside your studio. Cleaners and other workers are visibly nervous. What do you do? And so Patrick and Shiri, who are part of UVW, talked us through both the sort of ways you can resist in terms of direct action, but also the legal ways that you can resist and what your rights are in those situations. What about the one on the right? What year was that? Anyone? What? No. Ten? No. No. Twelve. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was from the Ducey. Yes, it was the go home bands, which were in a lot of um, very um, migrant, uh, of course, black uh, POC neighborhoods. Um, so Herring Gay saw them, South Hall, etc. And this was again like after Theresa May said that she wants to create a hostile environment, um, these began to roll out. And of course, a lot of raids were also happening in transportation areas. And surveillance and compliance. Within my workplace, a university, I'm expected to monitor tier four visa students and report having seen them for class or super supervisions. I'm deeply uncomfortable about this as it's not my job. I made my feeling no feelings known to management about this, but I need to take away awarding status. This is coercion by any other name. Culture workers are not special. Not in the context of the hostile environment and not in the context of labour organising. We are not special. Uh, and the way we should be organising, in my view, is with workers in all other sectors. Uh, find the points of solidarity and find the points where our skills, our networks, our experience can benefit other workers. So when people, kind of this group of artists, curators, cultural workers, academics, organizers, started to imagine what kind of we, world we want to see in five to 10 years, um, we, we cited um, more love, open borders, uh, changing the political system, making sure that the labor of pushing uh, social justice in institutions doesn't constantly fall on the shoulders of uh, women of color, people of color, migrants, um, because it, it it became apparent that this is a pattern that just keeps repeating. And how do we find a way to take those individual actions into some kind of collective activity, solidarity, that pays account of the fact that this is already not secret? Why does society knows about this? The Windrush scandal has made this extant, yet still there hasn't been a lot of change. So how do we turn our individual energy into collective action. This is so brilliant because all your voices are in here and this starts to build a common ground that regardless of our difference in skills, expertise, sort of positions that we hold, this can be what we build from. So our next meeting in February, we'll try to like bring this together and we'll share it back with everyone. But. We hope this is something that can connect and strengthen a movement which, you know, considering the government currently, there's a lot of work to be done, but at least this allows us to, to have our feet firm on the same ground with one another, which is the most important thing. Hey. Um, so, that was um, that was the, the activation date. As I said, it was in January 2020. Um, what we did, what, what happened, what happened during the, the event that, um, during the activation date is really that there was 
there was this energy and idea of a community of migrants and allies getting together and finding different ways of contributing to the work of migrants organized uh, of sorry <laughs> migrants and culture um that that can take different shape and forms and for us who were at the time uh, working as part of a core group um it was a way to gather really demands of the community and use them to devise um our work for the future what happened in the future is that our first meeting following this had to be cancelled uh, during the pandemic, uh, due to the pandemic, and we found ourselves, as everyone did, um, in unforeseen circumstances, and our work had to shift accordingly and to react to these new seismic ruptures that happened. So I want to just briefly talk about two things, one that we did and that one that we're doing as a result of the pandemic. Um, the first one, is a, a policy and advocacy document we produced again coalitionally called a culture sector recovery for migrants in which and here's a link there in which we suggest the 12 steps that a culture sector could take in the recovery process heralded by uh, the department for culture um, media and sport uh, to recreate and recover engage with recovery in a way that is acknowledging rather than completely ignoring migrants and it included steps such as uh, funding dedicated to support legal support and uh, healthcare support for migrants but also structural changes such as ending zero hour contracts uh, bringing all the labor um, in-house as opposed to outsourcing stopping um, uh, any any funding that is connected to corporations that directly um, contribute to migrant precarity uh, through their support of, of uh, anti-environmental uh, activities or arms trade and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, it's not surprising perhaps that the DCMS did not listen particularly to our demands, but what's important for us is that our coalition is growing the coalition of partners in both cultural and migrant sector is growing and that means that there is an increasing number of organizations who have an idea because they worked with us and worked on this with us as well of what a cultural sector that's responsible for and to migrants looks like and they can begin to implement that and when they talk to their partners who are not yet there but who are also in the cultural sector they can ask them the question of who is producing your migrant related work, how are you providing and taking care of your migrant workers and supporting them, um, what provisions they have for migrant workers and so on and so forth. The other thing that we're doing, and that's the last thing that I'll say, uh, that we're doing at the moment, and I want to um, ask you all to contribute, um, is we have two call outs at the moment. One is we're trying to figure out what has happened and how the situation has changed for the migrant culture workers in 2021. There's a new immigration bill that's punishing to all. Um, there is, of course, Brexit, and there's the precarity for migrants that was caused by COVID-19 due to problems with residency, separation from their families, from our families back home, no recourse to public funds, and many other problems I could speak about at length. And we want to know how migrants have been supported specifically or not uh, during this period and what has changed uh, for us. Um, as we begin to kind of regather this community that was dispersed during the pandemic. Um, and then secondly, we are creating a resource document for migrant culture workers that will collect and collate the different resources we know about that um, links to organizations, um, initiatives, people uh, that help and support migrants either professionally in the culture sector or through legal support, um, healthcare support uh, and other different forms um, of, of support because we again are finding that there is an area which there is not a lot done so while we're doing this big work on organizational restructuring uh, we also want to think about what resources can we make available on the ground okay so that's a bit about my uh, about uh, our work in migrants and culture thank you so much and i look forward to the discussion thank you so much Diana. Um, that was really interesting, and it's interesting to hear about. Um, I mean, I, I was particularly sort of shocked about the um, visa granting institutions and and the kind of responsibilities and I guess threats that come with that. Um, so that's that's really interesting, and I hope that we can get into some of those issues uh, in the discussion. Um, next, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Louis Cosetta, um, who works with Project Sheffield. Uh, sorry, Food Hall Project in Sheffield. 
Um, and he'll talk a little bit um, about that organization. Um, and Louis, I, I may have gotten the times wrong. You have between five and 15 minutes, as long as you want, really. Um, go for it. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks everyone for coming and thank you for the great um, introduction, Josh. Um, I, uh, so as Josh just mentioned, I'm part of a, uh, or I started a project called The Foodal Project, which is based in Sheffield. And um, it's a social eating uh, cultural center um, that has a series of kind of branch projects. And it's also the founding uh, project of, of what we're calling the National Food Service, um, which was, um, is a kind of infrastructure for social change using community food as a methodology of, of achieving that. Um, so those are those are the points that I'm coming from. Um, I've also got a background in architecture or social architecture, particularly um, is my interest. Um, so I really wanted to, when I kind of got the um, understanding of what kind of you what um we were talking about today um i realized it was actually a really quite complex but also um nuanced series of uh dialogues between uh, slightly different ideas um one of them is about how we restructure or we we think about institutions more generally as debt more debt being more democratic the other is i guess um, thinking about how we create new cultural institutions um, and think about that within the arts and cultural sector. And I think the third, in a way, is how we proliferate or create kind of cultural change uh, using, using these things. So I just kind of like wanted to do a, a little bit of a snapshot of some of our work um, and kind of play a few videos uh, so you get an understanding of, of what we're doing but at the same time, start touching on some of these ideas um, and kind of like, I guess, sowing the seeds for some discussions in a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen and let me know if this works for you. Um, can you see it? Yeah, great, fantastic. So as I mentioned, this is a this is a picture of the Futal Project from the outside. Um, if you come from the street um, in Sheffield, um, I'm gonna oh, sorry, I'm gonna play a video um, that tells you or I guess shows the atmosphere of the project more broadly, and um, yeah, it'll be great for you to see. Food is the way that cultures interact with each other beyond language. When someone comes into food or they experience a patchwork quilt of almost a hundred different cultures. The aim of the project is to bring everyone together. So it's creating a public space where anyone, regardless of who they are or what they have, can come and share together. This breaks down the barrier between taking the service and using the service. So they encourage people to join in, like do some watching up, get to chat to everybody, just create a community, really. I think the most rewarding part of volunteering at Food Hall is just the genuine human connection that you get to feel. I feel most like myself or like at least closest to who I want to be when I'm here. It's one of the few things that allows people to come together but also share culture and meaning with each other. You're sharing something beyond food just by sharing food. Oh, so I'm going to take this off. So um, the key idea um, behind the Foodal Project is, I'm, I'm going to go switch to presentation mode now, um, is essentially a kind of public space that references uh, human culture from since the beginning of time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this idea that there's a non-profit, uh, non-commercial space with decommodified food shared publicly and openly. And it's a very simple concept, like it's incredibly simple. Um, but because of the complexity and the kind of um, the, I guess, the market system we have, it's almost, in it's incredibly difficult to do in the Western context. Um, the, and maintaining that over a long period has, 
has been has been the biggest challenge. Um, so the idea is that people can come to a social eating space, um, but then through the social connections and through the kind of um, the new relations they build, you can create projects or it's a kind of a method of reproducing, um, I guess, social causes. So we have facilities um, that facilitate a whole host of different activities. Um, some are for people who are particularly marginalized, some are for people who are not so marginalized and um, we accommodate everything because it's a general purpose public uh, facility. Um, just thinking a little bit, so I'm, doing, I'm going to show a few cartoons. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the important ideas, I guess, thinking about governance um, and kind of democratic governance, I guess, is actually like really in key to our project has been this action research kind of approach where we're like actually doing actions and then we're kind of re-articulating that in research and that becomes a reciprocal dynamic that allows us to test and experiment and be honest about whether what we're actually talking about is is real or we've 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 uh, need to do more work on it and it's a kind of a bit of a, a slog to kind of approach um both the production of a physical you know uh, spatial project like that but also to kind of try to begin to think about research or kind of forwarding new research like that but i think um it allows us to kind of uh create a more scientific um w way or like um way of creating projects um so it means that we essentially can kind of make observations come up with hypothesis and experiment with those in real time. And we're not kind of always being um, relying on text-based methods of knowledge production as the key form of knowledge production we have. Um, so this kind of links in with ideas um, from Stafford Beer. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's ever like looked at uh, cybernetics that much, but um, interesting kind of ideas around um, kind of systems which interpret or autonomous systems that interpret the signals and things from the local environment and bring them in and respond to them in a cycle you know um, and that's a kind of essentially a uh, you can use food as an entry point for that but you can kind of expand a lot of um a, a really rich program <laughs> from that point um so this is kind of what that process starts to look like um you know people want all sorts of things and we kind of see patterns in, in what people need and want and we start to respond to those over time um as tasks that we we task ourselves with um so one of our kind of this is a an impossible perspective from the top of food hall um, in the cartoon form but um you can see that essentially i guess the way we've kind of delineated or we use the space is that we like ne a large part of the way we've used this space is that we kind of have our social eating cooking space and we have a flexible space that accommodates a, a lot of different events um, in the back, but also largely accommodates social arts. We normally do kind of social arts or kind of, um, it's always normally interesting social practice. So kind of thinking about how we bridge the divide between community space and community culture with arts um, organizations and arts facilities. I think there's this beautiful intersection here um, where people kind of, you can come in for your food and you leave with an amazing understanding of a culture from far away, you know? Um, and that's like a beautiful kind of um, synergy um, because you're realizing that people have different uh, inequality and engagement within the arts is is related to whether they people have the most basic forms of their Maslow's hierarchy of needs fulfilled you know like so do you have uh, warmth do you have shelter do you have food you know so if we want to increase engagement in the arts in a way we need to actually pay attention to those um, as real things uh, and so I think this is the notion of public is it's not really public it, it are if if people can't access it because they've got so much else on their mind you know um they so um yeah one of the big things that we've always done is kind of like looked at how we create a flexible agile 
institution um, and we just change a lot <laughs> um, because of our feedback uh, loop and our continued feedback. So here's an example, a visual example of that. This is our facade. We have this like beautiful facade that just changes every few months. And uh, we've had a bubble facade. We've had like a kind of uh, translucent um, film facade. So um, yeah, the idea is that that's kind of starts to represent the kind of different cultures and the meaning of people that uh, engage with the spaces. Um, this is it at the moment. Um, this is it when we were doing the National Food Service Conference. That's our notorious bubble facade. Didn't last for too long, um, but we were... <laughs> There was a conference uh, on Schlotterdijk. I'm not sure if anyone's read Bubbles uh, Spheres by Schlotterdijk. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, so here is a, a video of the street. <laughs> so it's a real, um, it's, oh God, hang on. I'll go next. So it's a real uh, place for everybody, you know, and also this methodology of us kind of being in situ and kind of trying to listen to people and articulate their needs, but also kind of come up with inventive solutions to those is a way that it can be made by everybody, you know. Um, so I'm just going to kind of flick through a bit of the atmosphere of the cultural events. One of the really important things I wanted to discuss about democratic ownership and democratic governance was I guess we've got this really interesting model in Food Hall, which is our branch structure. So we have our kind of core structure, which is staffed and has kind of roles and everything. But we also allow autonomous voluntary organizations that will have their set own ownership structure and their own kind of like um, their own capacity. And that's really the only link between us and them is ideology, you know, um, and which is really interesting because in a neoliberal system, it's like, how do you work within and against neoliberalism? Um, where it's kind of like, what do we, what methods and structures do we use to, um, yeah, hijack or hack the neoliberal system to allow um, people to make cultural organizations that are as dynamic as they would be in a different uh, form of organizing. Um, so yeah, that allows us to do um, a really great deal of activities and events uh, because these uh, independent voluntary organizations that normally come from our volunteer groups or come from the connections within the community just spring up and create a series, serious flurry of events and then um, might either move on or become a larger organization themselves. Um, and it's kind of this idea or it's kind of an anarchist idea, I guess, of um, how you uh, how you hive off new cells as the original grows. Um, so here's some uh, insights into our kind of uh, what some of our what some of our events have looked like in the back of the space. Um, people watching talks. This kind of meta, like this is what everyone's doing right now. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> but this is it in real life one day we'll go there in real life um here's a large meal after some of those talks and here's people just discussing and organizing in the car park um an image of the kitchen our tr notorious shopping trolley very well used that shopping trolley so we collect waste food often and a lot of <laughs> a lot of it has been done in very low-tech ways for a really long time maybe too long um and yeah film nights so some of our branches include you know our we've got our club but we also do wednesday evening meals cooked by the community so anyone can come and cook for their city and host a big event here we also do late evening events and things like that um and markets and stuff um i'm not sure how much time have i got left is this am I, have i run out already or uh no you're good you're, you're totally good okay cool so i wanted to share a little bit about one particular artist that joined the community using that was kind of essentially came because of completely different reasons and they engage with the community um through the food and kind of for the company um and it turns out they had an incredible life story and they've been creating art um in 
they were a, a victim of uh, modern day slavery for years, for several years. And um, the community bounded together to give Zumina this, their first exhibition, just kind of autonomously, like on the fly, because it was really important. Um, and I think that that's something that represents how if arts organizations or cultural organizations are rooted in the real needs of people, then you start to uh, allow people who might not otherwise be able to show or express their work or actually come to the surface about that because they have so many other time commitments and needs, they can actually start to focus on the liberation of their life. Um, so this is a video about Zoomina and Zoomina's kind of work. Uh, I'll just play this now. Artists for me is not what I see. It's not what I think. It's what I feel. My art work is the shape of my feelings, the shape of my perception, the shape of my intuition. It's the colors of my emotion. I am a Shomina. I am a victim of human trafficking. With 17 years old, I was trafficked to Europe to work in a sexual slavery, where I spent more than 10 years of my life. At such a young age, this traumatic experience make me completely lost in my essence, my pudo, my principles, and then my expectation for life. After with many mistakes, I learned quickly how to survive in an underdeveloped world. I always saw myself in different personalities, in different identities, and I had to use that to work in the street. After every client left from my room, I had to face myself I had completely frustrated feelings and disturbed emotion. All that I could do was take the next path to find the energy again and make my makeup and the back to the street. I had two ways to escape from my reality. One was taking drugs, another was arts. That's how arts come to me. As an artist, I realized that this was for me a big and a real performance experience. This is where myself, my mind, exhibition coming from. Now, between glass, clay, plaster, fabric, paint, and brush, I express my deep feelings and shape my imagination. Any material that inspired me could be used for any specific details. My inspiration coming from inside me, guided from my intuition. My artwork is the interface of my heart. It's my connection with energy, frequency and vibration. It's a piece from my own performance in my life. So Zumina um, is an incredible artist, but this was their first exhibition. Um, and it was most of the things that they had created were during this kind of hostile time and uh, kind of created with uh, things that they just found or uh, salvaged objects. Um, so that's a just an indicator of the kind of the cultural exchange that um, that comes about because of because of this. And it also allows people to tell their story. He, he's it's about identity. Sometimes uh, community space is about identity and building people's identity and creating identity um, and that allows kind of people not only to own a small part of what we do, but also own themselves. You know, they are they are somebody. So that's really important to continually strive to um, allow pathways for that to happen. I wanted to talk a little bit about National Food Service. Um, I'm not sure if we're running out, but I'm going to quickly touch on this. We're running out of bit, uh, but, but go for it. Cool. OK, so the idea behind the National Food Service is uh, kind of to make a project like Food Hall uh, or similar to Food Hall, which uh, focus on social eating um, as the core dynamic. Um, but also there's a kind of an idea that um, our public services have always emerged from our surpluses. And for example, our public libraries might have emerged because of the capacity we had because of surplus books, because of printing press and so on. And actually there's a kind of, there's an idea that because we have so much food, like surplus food and 40% uh, of the world's food is wasted, we've almost got a public service there ready to be made. You know, it's almost like just, just, just we need to 
tune the right things together. We need to clip the right dots. And actually, the um, if 40% of the world's food is wasted, it means that uh, half of all food could be given away for free. Do you know, like the real reality of that statistic is kind of quite mad. Um, but the idea behind this, and I think it still needs a lot of work and we've been thinking about this like loads, like, but there's still like, what ideology are we in now? What, what world are we in post COVID? And also, you know, the National Food Service was something that we created in, in, in Sheffield, but has now got branches in 15 different uh, cities um, that are developing. And what do we, in a, in a way it's like, what do new public services look like? And what, are we the commons or are we a public service? Or are we, you know, how does that actually fit within these preconceived notions or these preconceived ideas? One of the things that uh, we can think about uh, is that, well, you know, public services have always gone uh, or have, you know, have transformed several times. Um, so in kind of Victorian times, it, they were really patchwork uh, provided by kind of church organizations and things like that. In the 60s, you would have quite a highly centralized uh, public service where there's a clear hierarchy between service producer and service user and kind of the market, which is our kind of terrible system we have now where there's a kind of monopoly, it's people outside the market. So it doesn't accommodate for all need. Um, and there's a really high bar barrier to entry. Um, but is there a way we can create new mutualist or common space services, um, which is really interesting, the kind of work that Commonwealth Think Tank could be doing on that um, to kind of inform some of our thinking on that. But yeah, reciprocal skills um, and how do we create a system where the service user and service provider can blur a little bit more and we can create more domestic scale activities on the public domain, you know? Um, so we're not just only having domestic activities in our household, but we have our communities um, that are based around domestic scale activities in a wider sense. Um, so we had some fantastic speakers talk at our first seminar and conference on this. Um, and yeah, we've uh, one of the major things that happened. So that started in 2017 and it just really during COVID, it like was a really, really important network. Like we just shared rapidly all of these kinds of ideas, thoughts, like how we manage these problems and we created a system where we kind of linked in with the state, um, but they weren't really prepared to like link in with the mutual aid groups or anything like that. Um, but we supported a lot of mutual aid groups and kind of we, we made a bit of a chain where the registered orgs could kind of communicate and contact the state and then they could also kind of informally kind of delegate some work to the mutual aid groups um which was kind of like an interesting uh, way of doing it but yeah we delivered uh, over fifteen thousand meals in over four month period and in a national food service network it was over two hundred thousand meals we delivered um during COVID-19 at the beginning of the crisis, which meant that we have now these really important like heat maps of like the city of where food insecurity really is uh, relate in relation to kind of um, traditional demographic data, which is actually always quite obscure and weird. Like, and we find there are kind of, or we find that there are like places where affluent and marginalized people are like living on top of each other and not able to connect. And these are the places where new social public services and things like that might be really important and pivotal. Um, so there was one more kind of um, video, but I think I might just stop it now. Um, and yeah, because I am really, I'm aware of time. Sure, um, let's, we'll, we'll pick up some of the stuff um, kind of as we go in the questions as well. So we'll come back cool. to it. Um, cool. Great, I'm, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, give a quick introduction um, on my end. Um, and Lou, if you could stop sharing your screen so I could start sharing my screen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to give a quick run through of Commonwealth stuff. Um, and uh, hopefully it would help kind of contextualize this discussion a little bit. Um, I also am going to ask the uh, panelists real quick and also to remind myself uh, that when it comes to um, names to slow down um, for the BSL. Um, Commonwealth um, is a think tank um, which does policy work around developing and designing new models of ownership um, for a more democratic and sustainable society. Um, the idea there is um, comes out of, I guess, the, the new economy movement, which is um, a movement of, of thinkers and organizations um, kind of working out of a 
I guess, a post-austerity moment or perhaps not post-austerity at all, but out of a kind of new reality um, of a real dire need for um, change on two fronts, um, one being kind of deep inequality um, and that inequality not only being in terms of um, income, which is we typically think about, but also just in terms of wealth, about who um, owns the assets in our society, um, who um, yeah has, has power in a society essentially. Um, and the second kind of crisis um, being um, the climate crisis. So um, changing our society uh, with a kind of pace um, and at scale um, that can match a, a basically a planetary um, issue. Um, and coming out of the new economy movement, um, Commonwealth um, was sort of born out of a, a, a paper um, that came out um, a few years, um, I think it was around 2016. Um, so kind of uh, during a sort of Corbyn moment. Um, uh, and that paper was looking at um, cooperatives um, in the UK and how cooperatives could scale up. So one of the issues with, with uh, the cooperative movement is that um, you know, you might have a, a, a local co-op um, near you, for example, uh, food co-ops are, are quite popular, um, but, but how do you scale those cooperatives? Um, how do you scale that up so that it could actually kind of transform the economy and provide alternatives on a large scale? Um, so Commonwealth um, came out of this report that proposed um, something called an employee ownership fund. Um, and that fund, uh, which sounds like a bit of dry policy, but is really um, quite a, uh, a radical idea about um, taking organizations, companies above a certain um, employee uh, kind of limit. So the original proposal looked at kind of any company over 500 employees. Um, you would work over the course of five years to transfer the ownership of that ownership of that company to um, or a 10% stake in the ownership of that company to the workers. Um, and the idea there is that you would over time give um, workers a say on the board, for example, so in decisions that really matter to them in the workplace. Um, and this would be this employee ownership fund would be something that's um, instituted kind of uh, in a legal basis so that companies over 500 employees would be mandated to do so. Um, this was a policy that was taken up by uh, John McDonald during um, uh, and, and Corbyn during the, the um, uh, by the Labour Party. Kind of in the run-up to the to the uh, twenty nineteen election, um, and um, it was a kind of way of thinking about yeah, how do we not just transform institutions, but also make sure that that transformation um, can grow um, and expand. Um, along with that, um, one thing uh, that Louis mentioned that we've been working on um, uh, for about two years now, and, and one of the projects that um, I'm working with with Commonwealth at the moment is. Um, kind of oral history um, or kind of an oral audio project around interviewing people who are uh, in the process of trying to kind of collectively own or community um, community ownership of assets um, and, and transferring those to something called a, a public commons partnership or the prospect of a public common partnership um, as a model for um, owning assets collectively. Um, I'm going to share my screen because this will make a little bit more sense when it is um, illustrated. <clears throat> Hopefully everybody can see that now. And I'm going to present this. Right, so um, the idea of a um, uh, a public commons uh, partnership is is meant to kind of replace a uh, private, um, a public private partnership, wh which was the kind of very neoliberal model for um, for you know hospitals, um, um, all sorts of construction pro projects, um, a lot of uh, social housing projects over the last kind of two decades have been carried out uh, basically where you have a big company um, come in and. Um, uh, work with the government and the government takes on all the risks so that if that project fails, uh, the government is now responsible. Um, and if that uh, project succeeds, uh, the company has um, a massive, massive uh, revenue generating uh, kind of project for many years. Um, the idea with a public commons partnership is to kind of replace that. Um, and so you would take, um, let's say, um, 
you know, an instance where uh, there's a community kind of uh, effort to to reclaim an asset. So uh, one thing that that it was looking at, it continues to to work with the the Latin Village um, um, project, which is up up in North London. Um, basically, a uh, a market that was um, set to be torn down by a developer, um, a, a real kind of uh, anchor for the Latin community in North London. And the idea was, how could we have all of these kind of local community members, these traders, um, you know, have some stake in, in what's going on. And, and they were the folks that were kind of making um, the, the market what it was, um, and uh, they should have ownership over it. Um, so the idea would be you have this um, kind of joint em enterprise that would be 50% um, uh, owned by a commons association. So that would be kind of the movement um, if we want to think about it in that way. Um, and then 50% co-owned with the local authority. Um, and then there'd also be um, some stakes from um, a third party. So uh, unions, for example, um, or you might think about, um, uh, you know, a group of experts or perhaps kind of an environmental organization. So it's a way of thinking about how uh, um, organizations, social organizations, movements uh, could come together and, and own um, a portion of, of the assets that are locally beneficial and, and also made up by, um, you know, the community itself. Um, from there, if I can change the slide, there we go. Um, you could also, this may seem like a confusing um, sort of graph, but the idea is that these um, public common partnership, you might say Latin Village, would also connect up with another organization and help with funding, for example, to grow another organization so that they could um, they could kind of buy out, let's say, a community asset. Um, and these different organizations would support each other and would work in a network. And that's how you would kind of scale up this idea. So, so one thing that Commonwealth was really interested in was, was how can we take these um, kind of alternative models of institution building and then also scale them up? Um, Another um, project that we've worked on quite a bit is around um, uh, kind of, I guess, tech, um, but also digital infrastructure. So stuff like broadband, um, uh, full fiber broadband, which uh, particularly in rural communities in the UK is uh, really poorly served because you have private companies that basically cherry pick where they want to go that's going to be profitable for them to install um, infrastructure, and then they will ignore um, rural communities where it's less profitable to do so. Um, so we uh, kind of did this mapping project where we looked at different areas, what their um, sort of uh, connectivity rates were on full fiber, which is sort of the I don't know, very geeky, but but kind of the the top, um, uh, or almost the top, the top kind of broadband home connection that you usually get. Um, and it's also really important that full fiber network is really important. It undergirds stuff like 5G, which, which people talk about quite a bit. Um, so um, the idea um, was looking at different instances where um, communities have been able to come together and, um, and win uh, broadband. Um, so some of those are historic. So in Hull, for example, there's a kind of historic um, uh, sort of independence when it comes to telecoms so that um, there are a real sense of, of, of a community stake in it. Um, in other places, like this is a really kind of lovely example that, that uh, uh, I, I, I like to bring up a lot is, is uh, Broadband for the Rural North, which is a community organization which is um, installing uh, broadband uh, basically just by themselves, rolling it across fields um, as opposed to what big companies do, which is they have to make roads or, or kind of do some serious kind of um, uh, line work. Um, but this is a cheaper way of doing it that the community comes together and will roll wires across field to make sure that everybody has broadband and then they own and operate that broadband together, which I think is really neat. Um, so this is the kind of work that we were looking towards for thinking about what, what kind of demands should be put forward in terms of digital infrastructure? How could we uh, own that digital infrastructure as a community? Um, of course, that also extends to things um, uh, like the tech sector more broadly. Um, so um, as Karis mentioned, I'm working on a project around um, uh, digital co-ops and tech co-ops, platform co-ops, as they're sometimes known, which are basically anything from software develop developing firms to game designing firms to uh, kind of a group of graphic designers that might come together to um, operate as a co-op. Um, the big issue with that, um, uh, is is often funding, of course, um, that tech companies 
do really well because they have massive amounts of venture capital funding of basically private investors that hold a stake. Um, but when it comes to tech cooperatives where everybody kind of is holding a stake in the ownership together, um, how do you get funding for that? How do you get startup funding? How do you get seed funding? So looking towards, yeah, maybe that's like um, incentivizing councils to support those, invest in those, um, or a public uh, kind of venture capital fund, which would be run by the government. So that would be a kind of public share. Um, or you could have something um, uh, like um, community wealth building initiatives, which um, is this idea of making sure that wealth stays within a community, um, mainly through procurement um, policies. So a local council might say, oh, we need to build a new website. Um, and you could mandate, well, that local council should be looking within their bounds to um, uh, build a new website and to um, uh, keep that wealth kind of within bounds rather than outsourcing it um, or oftentimes um, bringing it to London, uh, which is which is what happens. Um, so community wealth building um, is something that we we take a lot of inspiration from that started um, up in Preston and in Cleveland in the States. Um, but Preston has been kind of um, the, the, the beacon um, for a lot of organizations that are uh, thinking about how, um, um, how institutions and how the, the local government might be able to keep wealth within the community and grow wealth within that community. Um, so um, with tech co-ops, we might think about the way that um, a local council will, will, will mandate uh, that they keep council kind of uh, tech work within uh, the cooperative sector which would be kind of exciting prospect. Um, but this is all really speculative sort of policy work. Um, I wanted to also mention briefly uh, before I run out of time, um, a project that we've done around um, steelworks in, in Wales, um, looking at um, a new sort of uh, plan for the steel sector to green the steel sector um, and also support um, the you know, better working conditions. Um, the, the steel industry has a really interesting his, um, kind of um, I guess social housing tradition, um, particularly in Wales, where um, the when the steel industry started, there was a massive push for more social housing to um, to ramp it up and um, uh, to to basically support it, support the workers with with adequate housing um, in places like Port Talbot. So thinking about um, mission oriented um, economies that could uh, bring in social housing as well as kind of greening industries. Um, as part of a Green New Deal. Um, so yeah, we look towards kind of the history of, of steelmaking and, um, and how can you kind of pull that from that history in terms of, of uh, collective ownership and community ownership initiatives. Um, and this is very technical, but looking at uh, greening steel, which is kind of an exciting um, uh, prospect, uh, particularly for thinking about sustainability, steel is 15% uh, of the UK's um, uh, industrial emissions. So there is a way to do this through hydrogen, which is a way less pollutant. Um, but that is a little bit off track. I'm going to share, stopping sharing my screen for a second, and I'm going to put on a quick video, and then I'm going to transfer over to questions. Um, and this um, video is from a steel worker that I um, interviewed. Um, and uh, the idea here was, was thinking about um, the kind of um, industrial history um, and um, and the kind of sense of ownership that workers and unions feel over um, that industrial history in communities, uh, which I think is uh, is something that uh, definitely w w at Commonwealth is something that I uh, was thinking a lot about. Um, so let's see if I can share my screen here. Share. My name's Alan Coombs. I'm the chairman of the multi-union committee that sits in Port Talbot Steelworks. My father was a steelworker. My, my both grandfathers were steelworkers. You'd get your union meetings, but mostly everything was done within the pub, or workmen's pubs, or rugby pubs, and clubs, and things like that. For better or worse, punk was what I got into. I don't believe. 
it was a bit bizarre, really, when you think about it. Six, 16 year old who's listening to all this punk music and then thinking, oh, I'll have a go of that. But I suppose that's that's what happened with punk music, wasn't it? That's what most of the people started at it thinking, I can have a go, I can make as noise just as bad as that. So a lot of it was at local in the South Wales area, you know, workman's clubs and stuff like that. And try, and most of the stuff was stuff that, that you organise and put on yourself, not through agents or something, just through a group of mates. You find out regular venues that have any sort of live music. You go along, you listen to a band, and uh, then you approach the owners and say, yeah, have we got any vacancies, any chance of a booking, so to speak. Still do it now with a group of guys, all the same age as me. Some of them have been playing in bands with for 40 years. Band I'm with at the moment is a band called The Front. I just love the noise and the excitement of it, and uh, I love going to watch bands play. I go, go as much as I can to go to watch live music, it's something I've had a massive interest in. I often say it, it's all I'd want is for the people that live in, in the surrounding areas, Port Talbot, South Wales, to have the same opportunities I've had, to support the family, good living out of it, a good standard of living. There's an understanding that things have got to change and we've got to move on from an environmental point of view, which is right. But it's difficult to see what that looks like. There's not enough knowledge about how we actually do it, what sort of technology. We need a strategy going forward of what we're actually going to commit to. I don't believe it will stay the same. I don't think it can stay the same. It wouldn't be right to stay the same, to be perfectly honest with you. I think the majority of people I know are looking after some of the elderly parents or grandparents or whatever it may be. It's a major part of life now, isn't it, Karen? We've got to start looking at what the work-life balance is. Shorter working weeks, shorter hours and that. The reality of it is, if we're improving in society, that's what we should be looking at. Shouldn't be looking at going backwards and going back to the 60s. Should be looking at going forward and improving quality of life. Um, great. Um, so, um, yeah, to wrap up, I guess, thinking a little bit about um, how workers can have a stay in um, uh, the changes, uh, particularly at the community level um, and at things like a Green New Deal and a just transition away from, from fossil fuels. Um, I'm going to transfer over now to questions. Um, I'm going to pose to Boyana and Louis um, the first question. Um, which is what kind of challenges are you guys facing in changing what the model of civic institutions um, are meant to look like or, or what they do look like? Um, what kind of challenges are, are you both hitting up against? Maybe Louis, do you wanna jump in first? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. Thank you for that um, great presentation, Josh. Um, I, this is a really, Really good question. Um, how do we, so my response is that I think we need to scale, you've spoke about it before, but scale up kind of what we're doing. It's really big, we've got a lot of blocks to how we scale um, community-based work. Um, for example, a lot of work that needs to be done is unpaid, which is a paradox because obviously the market isn't providing for the work that needs to be done. Um, but this is also a kind of, I think, gonna increase as automation increases and the biggest imp aspects or the biggest labor, um, I guess labor, the, the most labor of our time will probably be spent on environmental labor and, you know, um, and solving governance issues, but also like, um, yeah, so a lot of social issues. Um, so how do we, those are really like unpaid things, you know? <laughs> um, so how do we create systems for places or people to, to, you know, be supported in that work? Uh, if, if we're gonna, if we're gonna overcome those massive environmental challenges and social challenges that we face um and how do we relate to other voluntary organizations um it's really difficult um it's really important um but the problem i don't think is is at the individual voluntary sector scale it's like there's a kind of notion that maybe uh, things could collaborate but also i think the way that the system is structurally created maybe um doesn't advance um yeah, advance kind of pathways to uh, relate with each other um, and kind of grow a movement uh, in that way. But also how do we sustain voluntary kind of, yeah, like how do we 
increase the capacity of our movement to like deliver more without withering the soul of what we've created like that's a really really hard challenge because what the immediate solution to like solving these problems is like to make it like really kind of like it's a state solution do you know which might retract a lot of the culture that we've built up and it might increase hierarchies you know and it might actually create so kind of is there a way we can create I guess what Colin Ward calls the welfare road less trodden, the the road we could have taken, but maybe we didn't have the right uh, infrastructures, um, the communications infrastructures and kind of the, the cultural ownership infrastructures that allow more kind of like um, mutualist ideas to become real thriving public services that have a genuine culture that relate to the needs of the people and their, their real like energy. Problem we always face is that like, people you know yeah so people are always struggling with the over bureaucrat uh, bureaucratization of kind of state run facilities like service end users and we really need to solve that problem like we really need to provide these services really well and um that's a really um, and we there's a possibility with all of the kind of technological advancements and things like that, that we could really do that if we create new public services. Um, so yeah, how do we retain that culture? Um, I think they're the challenges I see, if that's a, is that's an okay response. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know you had spoken earlier about, um, about the, the kind of, uh, yeah, COVID-19 sort of uh, mutual aid societies and, and kind of what, what happens after that, which I think is a, is a really interesting sort of provocation. Um, but yeah, I, I know that Migrants and Culture works as a, a volunteer run organization. Is, is there something you want to pick up in that or, or additional challenges that, that you're kind of looking at? I think, yeah, so we are for the most part completely uh, voluntary. Um, and we now after three years are getting bits and pieces of funding for which you know, we write applications and that time is also unpaid <laughs> if you spend writing the funding application, but um, for specific strands of work, but most of the stuff that we do is completely uh, voluntary for all of us. Um, I, I'm thinking about stuff Louis like said, and I guess one of the challenges I would say to be completely blunt is that the government is doing what it wants to do really well. Uh, the idea is to make the UK a very hostile environment for migrants. Um, and, and that is happening. And so if it's difficult, it's increasingly difficult, although we are of course increasingly motivated to, um, to organize around migrants writing culture when the visa fees are going up, the visa roads are closing, when as an artist you're faced with increasingly xenophobic cultural sector that doesn't understand how it's being xenophobic, when it imposes restrictions on who can apply for what funding, which commissions and so on and so forth. So I would say that there is a problem of there is intent on the other end. The thing that motivates our work has intent and they're very successful at what they're doing. I also think as a voluntary, mostly voluntary organization, I think there is a question of capacity. Uh, all of us are to various degrees in, as migrants in precarious situations, but there is a, a serious issue of capacity and longevity. And we are constantly trying to figure out ways to building mechanisms into how we work and replenish our work and, and replenish who's doing what work so that there's the organization, the organizing work doesn't end up relying on individuals so that we can overcome those issues of, of precarity. And I also think with any voluntary run uh, effort, there is always, and I think this hangs on a bit to what Lou was saying, there is a question of who can afford to do voluntary work, you know? so. You, you, you have to be able to volunteer um, and you have to be able to give away time for free. And I know from personal experience that just wanting to is not enough. I, I you know, I was in, this, I came to a financial position maybe four or five years ago where I could afford to start um, being engaged in that kind of organizing work around migrants rights that, was, that wasn't paid up until then, I financially could not afford to do that. So I think there's a lot of structural challenges. Um, and I think I'm thinking a lot in the back of my head, that's the last thing that I'll say about what Louis said about um, service providers and service users. 
and how in the arts definitely since new labor there has been a gradual push for the art sector to use its funding to provide what we would normally think of services uh, and for artists to act uh, first as facilitators and now increasingly in various kind of almost social worker roles um, we are not equipped to do that, we are not trained to do that, and someone else should be doing that. And I think there is a real danger in that. I think that's a real challenge to not fall into a trap um, uh, in the arts, particularly of following the funding to the point where you are now <clears throat> providing the service that actually, in my opinion, at least we should be demanding the state. To, to provide because that's why we pay taxes. And in a lot of the cases in the art sector, these are services that have been cut uh, through over a decade of austerity that local councils used to provide. So I think there's a crumbling infrastructure, a very successful set of government policies, and then people who are organizing on our end are all in various states of precarity due to our positions as migrants. I think that's uh, such an excellent point about the way that um, um, kind of arts and social institutions are taking on the role that governments and yeah public bodies should really be serving um, and and yeah how do you kind of make those that set of demands um, in that in that moment um, you know while also having to yeah I guess it's this within and against the state kind of issue isn't it I mean I was wondering um, you know from from um, your folks perspective um, you know what is the what is the kind of relationship here between um, the state and, and um, social and cultural institutions? I mean, what, what kind of demands should we be putting forward? Um, and, and what does the role of the state look like in, in establishing a commons? Um, maybe, uh, Louis, if you wanted to, to start or, or jump on any aspects of that. Um, I think that we there's just a bit of rewiring to be done i think that we see there's a lot of ethical issues here like if you don't if we don't create services that um need to be created who you know who's doing that you know like it's kind of normally the people who care the most isn't it Do you know like and it, so there's a there's an importance there um and i think that like the state is relying on people who care to just continually regenerate and not get burnt out and you know um but it's really hard and i think that to answer your question quite directly i think as we rewiring between the state and the commons and quite frankly there needs to be a clearer legal structure and uh, around what a commons is like we really you know we're working with company structures that are like essentially you know companies you know and they're kind of essentially we and cooperative structures in the uk are heavily disincentivized at the moment you know the only thing that's heavily incentivized is to be a normal like limited company and that's kind of like the best option and you know the thought of like so we're kind of hacking within those frameworks and trying to create communities and kind of systems within these kind of like kicks and kind of like all of this stuff we just don't have like the the company uh, the the company or legal structure that is a commons structure do you know like what actually what can i go and register as that like <laughs> you know like it's it's impossible so actually getting to grips with what that means not just academically uh, but also like practically is really important for organizations like ourselves and many others i think um so that is one of the key ways we could uh, exert some form of influence i think that um there's a lot to there's a lot to overcome um in the nature and i think what bo Bojana was saying is really like correct basically about um yeah all of those comments i um, really resonate with them so yeah thanks for sharing these um i i've definitely heard a lot from kind of tech co-op uh folks that that even trying to establish as a co-op is just this massive massive bureaucratic kind of hoops that you have to jump through to get there whereas you can open up a uh, limited company in a you know matter of uh, you know an hour or something basically it, it's really straightforward um 
just to remind um, the audience that we um, we are taking questions uh, in the chat box. So um, I am waiting for uh, questions. We've had some great comments that have come in. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, Beth um, uh, for for uh, chiming in with with some comments here. But um, uh, anybody that'd like to drop in questions um, now is absolutely the time to do it um, because uh, if you don't, hi, do Josh. Josh, sorry to interrupt. So there's a few questions in the Q&A box, which is sort of a bit confusing, separate to the chat box. Ah. There's um, a couple in there and from Beth and one from David as well. So just pointing you to those if you wanted to Fantastic. build any of those. Sorry, good. sorry you didn't see it sooner. No, 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 that's great. Um, we have a question um, here from, from uh, Beth. Um, which says, uh, the lines between culture and service are so beautifully blended within your venues. Is there ever a point where you need to draw a line? Is there ever a worry that uh, as a cultural venue, you were having to provide too much service? Should cultural venues worry about filling the gaps in the UK services? We've actually just kind of um, uh, gone over that question a little bit. Um, but Anna, I wanted to also give you an opportunity to reply to that question about um, the state. Um, maybe I'll read out these questions and then kind of stack them on top of each other. Um, you mean uh, a bit slower, sorry. Sure, sure. Um, uh, another question here from Beth. Um, how do you feel about um, other historical or institutionalized cultural venues in the UK? Are they doing enough? How would you advise them to change? Um, maybe, Viana, I can, I can ask you to reply to the question about what we should be making demands on the state. Um, obviously, there's uh, an obvious one of um, open borders, but I guess one question is how do we get there? Um, and also this <laughs> question from uh, Beth, which is, um, uh, are other kind of historical uh, institutions and cultural venues um, doing enough, and what should they be? We be what should they be doing differently? Yeah, thanks. I also want to think. Beth mentioned in the chat that they work in um, Boston a lot, and that there's a, 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 a if that's the Boston I'm thinking of, that's a, one of the most Eastern European places in the UK that also overwhelmingly voted for Brexit, and there is a huge separation as Beth points out, between uh, the migrant community and uh, everyone else. And I think it's one of the spaces where you really see, or I have always seen a potential for, if there was actually some cultural infrastructure there, you could do a lot of indirect work of connecting those two communities, um, but there isn't. And so it's very easy for these two, um, or disparate communities to remain separate okay so let me try and be quick because I'm, I'm also trying um but not too quick <laughs> but uh because i'm aware of time the role of state so i was born in um, former yugoslavia so i have a very historically grounded um uh, socialist idea what a state should be providing uh i think for that reason um and i think i i always I am, I am always slightly skeptical of, of the people having to do everything on their own because I'm always worried about whether that's this neoliberal con that gets us to create services for ourselves. Um, and I'm always wondering how do we do community stuff and how do we at the same time put pressure on the state to provide services and how do we distinguish between the two? And I think what Lou is saying and everything that, that they're doing, I think speaks a lot to, um, to possible ways of doing that. So um, I think to kind of try and wrap it all into one, Beth asked about historical and institutional cultural values in the UK and to connect it to the state not too long ago, Oliver Dowden, who is the, the culture secretary sent a letter to the 25 of the biggest organizations and the cultural organizations, heritage organizations, so museums predominantly, and funders, state funders, to ask them to resist the rewriting of British history through arts and culture and accuse the quote unquote of woke minority of uh, quote constantly trying to do Britain down. Uh, and we have state subsidy that is now being conditioned on not talking about imperialism, colonialism, uh, histories of slavery connected to this country, um, statues and so on and so forth. So I think, I think the big cultural institutions in this country, most of 
or a lot of whom were built on this colonial and imperialist heritage are going to have a rocky time ahead of them. And I, I really look forward to seeing the resistance in those institutions um, with some fears. But I think now is the time that they will be asked to really resist what is clearly state censorship. Um, so that, that's what I think about the big cultural institutions and their role and the state. Um, and I think there's a clear wish to marginalize even further migrants and people of color and other people who are implicated in the immigration regime. And I think that the mostly white male British um, directors of these institutions now have the task, um, a gigantic task ahead of them. So let's see. Um, I, I know there's some really interesting um, kind of grumblings about um, repatriation, um, restitution of, of, of cultural objects as well, things like the Benin and bronzes, which, which should be really interesting to see how, yeah, these kind of historic institutions respond. Um, Louis, I, I, there's a question um, for you here about um, uh, ambitions for the National Food Service to start expanding to um, rural contexts. Um, I was wondering if you could um, speak a little bit to that. And, and I was also wondering, um, if you could help kind of unpack the term commons, which we've been we've been kind of using throughout, um, but but it might be useful um, kind of as, uh, almost as a closing remark to, to think a little bit about what 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 we really mean when when we say that. Um, it, do you think I could stack those two questions uh, for you? Is that, is that all right, Lou? Great. That sounds perfect. Cool. So um, so the National Food Service is at the moment a network of organisations that are. Um, kind of in alliance and kind of have separate organizational structures um, and but essentially are ideologically connected uh, to the point that they want to create a national food service um, and some of them have come because of the national food service movement so national food service bristol for example um, evolved out of uh, from some of our volunteers here they created a fantastic organization down in bristol and national food service um london also uh, related to volunteers and there are several other groups that were looking for something like a national food service and realized um, there wasn't really one so we need to kind of create one <laughs> because they were doing community level food work forever um and you know uh it's actually kind of makes a lot of sense to uh, create some solidarity system to push for a national food service uh, the point is that it's a response isn't it so this kind of touches on a little bit more sorry I, i'm going to just going to touch on a previous question and come right back to that question um the National Food Service is a response to this issue. In a neoliberal, highly neoliberal system, can we just create a National Food Service within the market system as a response? <laughs> you know, can we just say, well, this is our response to your market system that is exploiting everyone and things like that. We're going to create a national public service, you know, um, and we're going to subvert all of these things. We're going to kind of detourn them and actually create a new system that is completely uh, different and utilizes some of those, um, the beautiful thing about, um, neoliber well, the terrible thing about neoliberalism is, is <laughs> everything. But one of the things is that it's, if you can change a few things, it's quite close to social, you can create social anarchism from it. You know, you can start to build the, um, build things or frameworks that start to resemble like really quite advanced social anarchist systems. So um, it's kind of the only pathway it feels for me to create new cultural institutions at this point in time. Whereas if there was another, political system in, involved then maybe it'd be better to focus on that as a different process or uh, an agenda but it feels like we're kind of in the corner and we have to use the things we can use you know to create responses um so the national food service expand in rural context like the responses we yeah we we need to co-create it like uh you you can kind of send an email uh if if you're interested in joining the national food service as a campaign or or you've got organizations in mind um to help build it um but we're not we're not really centrally funded we are a network organization and at this point in time so um but that does work uh, to a degree because a lot of people can kind of join quite easily it's quite low barrier of entry and also we kind of uh, have a lot of learning and teaching within the network that like wealth of experience so um expansion 
yeah, like view to expand, uh, but also if you can help with that, that would also be fantastic because it's a social movement. So, um, yeah. Uh, and is there a, what was the second question? Sorry, I just sorry. Uh, um, uh, we're almost, uh, we're we're really we're really running out of time here. Um, cool. I guess uh, I'm looking for cues here. Um, I might, I, we might have to wrap it up. I'm so sorry. Um, it's this question, I guess, about the commons. And um, I guess if people want to email us, um, we will throw our um, emails in. But unpacking this question of the commons, which, um, which is definitely an important one. Um, but okay. I will, um, I will just have to call it. I'm sorry. Thank you so much to Boyana and, and to Louis um, and to uh, Karis for the introduction. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending today. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Josh, Biana, and um, Louis. Uh, yeah, sorry to wrap things up. Far too much to unpack in an hour, uh, but so interesting. Um, and thank you for tackling such meaty subjects and being so direct with the audience questions. Um, and just a reminder that the recording will be available online afterwards because <laughs> there was a lot to unpack there. Um, so thank you for so much, um, audience. If you'd like to join us for the next uh, conversation, it's digital infrastructures starting at quarter past. So you've got time for a quick cup of tea. Um, again, thank you to all the speakers, to the BSL, um, interpreters Jenny and Claire, and to Becky, our live scribe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.